Hello, everybody, uh, whoever is listening from there. We're here today um, in Bloomington. And today we're talking about a topic um, uh, there's a lot of different directions we could do with this topic. Um, I know yesterday um, or the other day, uh, Ben and I were talking, and she was talking about the idea of sometimes uh, we try to make uh, decisions, and we say, is it okay to make a decision when you really want something to be a certain way, but you know that the way to do it is not necessarily right? Like, does the end justify the means? That's a common American phrase or English phrase. Does the end justify the means? Which means that as long as it turns out the way I want it to turn out, it's okay. And, and we talked about that for a little bit. So today I'm doing a lesson. It's called, the name of the lesson is called, Does It Matter What I Do? That's the name of the lesson. Okay. So there's a lot of different directions we could go with this and examples that we could give. And this is just one, but in many places in today's world, we often think that anything is all right as long as we get what we want or something that someone else wants is accomplished. So one of the examples that was given as an example that Ben gave was she knew of somebody, and this is a fairly common thing of people that come into the US, but there are different people in, in the United States, for instance, that they'll come in and there's been even TV shows on it, where someone will come from another country. And for instance, they wanna stay in the country. So, um, and they know that maybe they, they're not gonna be able to stay in the country, but if they get married, then they might be able to stay in. Or if they get married and have a child, they might be able to stay in. So sometimes people will do that in an effort to be able to stay in another country like the United States, okay? But the problem is obviously if a person does that and they don't love that person they're marrying or they, you know, they have a child and that child was not born out of a relationship of love but just a, a relationship of, of uh, convenience, is that a good thing? Well, it depends on how you look at it. See, if you say, well, the most important thing is that I get what I want, then the person who believes that will say, yes, it's worth it. But if a person says, no, telling the truth and being real and genuine and not pretending I love somebody, but really loving them and, and having a child out of a loving relationship with my, with my spouse, these are things that are godly and good and right. And doing it the right way is more, than, more important than me getting what I want. So you can see that there's, there's kind of a dilemma there, and it depends a lot on where the person is operating from. Am I operating from a place of what I want is most important? Or am I operating from what is right and godly is most important? And a lot of that is going to go back to, do we, do we know God? Do we love God? Do we trust God? Because if we do, then we do what he says and we trust in him, even when sometimes on the surface, it doesn't seem to go well with what I want this minute. Now, let me give you some examples. I gave that one example that we talked about of maybe someone from another country trying to stay in another country. That's one example. <laughs> Here's some other examples that maybe you've heard of. Okay, some people would say, I don't need to believe in God. I don't need to honor God as long as I'm a good person. The only thing that's important is that I'm a good person. I don't have to honor God. I don't have to love God. I don't even have to believe in God. As long as I'm a good person, that's good. 
Another thing you might have heard, greed. Well, greed is good if it helps me to get rich. If I'm greedy and it helps me to work hard and get rich, then greed is good. There was a very famous movie called Wall Street where Michael Douglas stands in front of a whole group of people and he says, greed is good. And he says it because for him, making lots of money is the most important thing. Um, <laughs> depravity. Depravity is when you just do all kinds of crazy things, like, you know, having an orgy or just going nuts. It says depravity. Well, that can make for a great time at a party. There are a lot of people, they go to a party and they think, well, as long as I'm at a party, like if I'm at work, I should act a certain way. But if I'm at a party, I can do whatever I want. I can get high. I can get drunk. I could have sex with bunches of people. I could go crazy and tear up the place. And it just makes for a good experience. It just makes for a fun party. As long as we have a fun party and everybody's enjoying it, what's wrong with it? There are a lot of people that believe that. Envy. Some people might say envy is good if it makes me want to work harder to get ahead. So, for instance, maybe you have something. You have something that I would like to have. You have a new car. You have a, you have a, you're driving a new Lexus. I envy that. I want that. I wish I had what you had. I want that. Okay? Well, a lot of people would say, well, nothing wrong with that. That's good. That'll make you work hard. It'll make you put everything aside and work hard so you can go get your Lexus. It's envy. Some people think is good. Some people think that even taking someone else's life, Okay, which is considered murder, but not always, is it? For instance, what if a person's not born yet? What if a child is inside the mother's womb? Well, see, we have a lot of conflicting, we have conflicting laws on that. Because part of our law says it's okay for a woman to decide to kill her baby, as long as it's not born yet. She can have an abortion. She can kill that baby. Even if the baby has fingers and toes and, and, and is growing and has a head and a beating heart and lungs and is five months, she's five months pregnant, six months pregnant. We, we have a friend that just adopted a baby that was born in five months or six months. It was only four, four pounds. <laughs> but that baby lived. And that baby is alive. And our friends adopted that baby. And they're going to raise that baby to know God and to love God, and they're going to love that little baby. But some people believe, and it's legal, to go in and kill that baby. The woman can kill that baby if she chooses and not be held for murder. And yet, if, 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 if my daughter was pregnant, five months pregnant or six months pregnant, and somebody broke into her house and killed her, and they arrested that guy, he would be charged with two murders. He would be charged with murdering my daughter, and he would be charged with murdering her baby. Well, that doesn't make any sense, does it? Isn't that crazy? The same law that says it's okay for a mother to kill the child says that if you murder her and the child, then it's murder. So you kill that baby before it's born, it's murder. But if she kills it, it's okay. That's sick. In my mind, that's a sick law. Now, I know there are a lot of people who disagree with me, and that's okay. I mean, they, they're entitled to their opinion. But this is what they think. Being boastful or ruthless, that's okay. As long as I get what I need to get or I want out of this life. You see a lot of people, they're very prideful. They like to boast. You see athletes a lot of times, they like to boast. They say, I'm so great. I'm the best. They, I deserve $10 million. They should give me this. They should give me that. I'm better than all these other guys on the team. And they boast. And they think it's okay to boast. Why? 
because when I boast, I get a lot of attention. And if I get a lot of attention, if I'm a good player, and I get a lot of attention, a lot of press, then I get a bigger paycheck. So as long as I get paid more, it's great for me to boast. And they think it's fine. There are some people, for instance, they look at sex outside of marriage. God talks about having sex between a man and a woman being married, and that act, that sexual act, is meant to bring them closer together. It brings them to a point of intimacy, a closeness, and it's, and it's made sacred or special because there's nobody else in the world that knows me in that way except that one person. I'm the only one that knows her that way. She's the only one that knows me that way. So no matter how well you think you know me, only my wife knows me in that way. And that's special. That's sacred. That's how it's supposed to be. But a lot of people don't see it like that. A lot of people say, hey, look, man, sex is fun. It feels good. As long as it feels good, and I agree to it, and they agree to it, it's fine. I should do whatever I want, whoever I want. Whether they're married, whether they're not married, whether I do it with a man or a woman, it doesn't matter. Whether I do it with one person or two people or three people at the same time, none of it matters. The only thing that matters is that I'm having a good time, and everybody that's there wants to, is in agreement that they want to do it also. Therefore, it's good. These are things that people say. And why do they say it? Why do they say it? Because the final thing is what's right or what, what matters is that I get what I want. And as long as we in our society believe that what I want is the most important thing, then what I do really doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what I do. I can do anything unless someone's going to throw me in jail over it or something like that. I can do anything I want and my life doesn't matter. What I do doesn't matter. But now I want to read some scriptures to indicate that in God's eyes, it does matter. It does matter what I do. <laughs> God created us for a purpose. He didn't create us to just do whatever we want, whenever we want, however we want. He created us to have a forever relationship with Him. A relationship that's good and right and loving. He's given us scriptures so that we can know who he is and understand this full life that he means for us to live. Okay, you buy a car, and there's a driver's manual in it, isn't there? The guy who created that car is going to tell you that if you want to make the most out of this car, and you want to have good use out of it, and have long life with this thing, and have it be good, this is how you should take care of it. And if you ignore that and just do any old thing you want with it, there's a good chance you're not going to have that, will you? Well, God's our creator. And he's given us a life that he expects for us to live that makes it full and rich. He also tells us in the scriptures, he warns us about a lifestyle that will bring the opposite of that. It will not bring a full life. It will bring God's wrath. It will bring God's anger onto them. And, and it will bring separation from him. It will create a wall, a divider between us and him, if we live that way. In Romans chapter 1, verse 18, it says, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven, against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. 
since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what, he's been, what he has made, so that men are without excuse. So if you say, well, I never understood. Nobody ever told me anything about God. It's like, yes, he did. You got eyeballs in your head. You can look around you. You can see God's creation. If you got a, a gram of common sense in your head, you know that that was not an accident. That didn't just happen by accident. And I don't care how many scientists want to line up to try to tell you that it did. Common sense will tell you that's just insane. That's like taking 500 different pieces of metal and throwing it up in the air and think it's going to fall to the earth as a Cadillac. Okay? It, it's not going to happen. The complexity of this universe is unbelievable. And anybody that follows it is going to tell you that. But then in Romans in 21, he says, Although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. The fact is, we know that there's a God. Anybody who has the, the slightest openness in their mind and heart, know in their mind and in their heart that there is a God. <clears throat> and I don't care where you go, and there's several people here that are from China, and you know that for the last 60, 70 years, you've had a government that has tried to tell the people there is no God, 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 is no God forever. And I don't care how many times they say it, for how long they say it, they can even arrest anybody that says different and throw them in jail. And you know what? 70 years later, there's still huge numbers of people that believe and know that there's a God and look for him. And even those that are not actively worshiping have doubts in their heart and in their mind because they know they're not stupid. I don't care what anybody says to anybody. They can't steal your brain. They can't steal your heart. No matter what somebody tells me, when I look out, I know the difference between love and hate. I know the difference between the most unbelievably complex universe and, 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 and some simple creation like somebody's book or something. I know there's a big difference. So therefore, because they have taken on this futile thought process, God gave them over, the Bible says, in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie. They worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator, who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lust. Even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their perversion. Furthermore, since they did not find it, think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They are disobedient to their parents. They are senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, 
but they also approve of those who practice them. Is that all in Romans? It's all in Romans. Romans, Romans, <coughs> Romans 12. Romans chapter 1. Oh, Romans 1. Verses 18 through 29. Okay. Actually, you went all the way to 32. Uh, well, you're right. 32. You're 18 right. to 32. 32. You're right. I'm sorry. So, <clears throat> let's just take a minute. We go back here and look at some of the examples we said before we read this. Greed is good if it helps me to get rich. Greed is one of the things he's saying happens to people whose minds are corrupted and futile. I can come back and say depravity can make things a lot of fun. Depravity makes things, puts you in that category. Envy. Oh, it's a good thing. No, it's not. God doesn't want you to be envious. He wants you to be grateful. He wants you to be grateful for the good that you do have, not envious of what you don't have. And be, env be, be grateful for it and trust in him that he's going to direct your life and bring you to a full and rich life. And when I say full and rich, I'm talking about spiritually. Not necessarily materially, although many times it can also be materially, but it's not all necessarily materially. There are a lot of people that I've seen, there have been times in our life when we barely made enough money to pay our rent. We had a family of five. There was a time we had a family of five. I was making like 25000 a year, which sounds like a lot of money, I know, in some parts of the world. But I got to tell you, in the U.S., it's hard to live on that. That's not a lot of money. There are a lot of single people who make more money than that. You try to make a mortgage payment and feed a wife and three kids on that kind of money. Okay, but we were rich. We were rich in God's grace. And we were happy. <clears throat> and we weren't just envious and wanting everything else. We were, and God took care of us. God always provided for us. Every time we had a need that we couldn't meet, we continued to give. We gave to the church. We gave to others. We shared hospitality. We did all of these things even when we had hardly anything. And I can remember times... I can remember one week in particular, I didn't even have enough money to buy food. And one day I was at church and somebody walked over to me and said, here, somebody just gave me this and said to give it to you. And I said, well, what is it? And they said, I don't know, it's in an envelope. And I opened up and there was a bunch of money in there. So I could go and get whatever we needed. I don't know to this day who gave me that. I don't know who it was. But God moved somebody's heart to say, go and help. And they did. And there have been many years over the years where God has helped us. And there have been many times over the years where God's blessed us financially, where we've been able to give to help people. And that's part of being in God's world, is you receive and you give. And you learn to do both of them with gratitude in your heart. I mean, if you don't have money, there's ways you can give. There's ways you can give. You can give of your time, of your love. You can always be hospitable. Always be hospitable. There are examples in the Bible where a woman had a little bit of oil and a little bit of flour, and the prophet came, and there was her and her son, and he said, do you have anything to feed with? And she said, this is all I got. And you know what she said? She said, I'll cook it up, and we'll eat it together, and then we'll die. We'll starve to death together. And my last piece of bread, I'll give to you. I'll share with you. That's what she said. And you know what God did? God made sure that she had enough oil and flour to get through the worst famine there ever was. And she never went without. Ever. That whole time. And she was able to take care of herself and her child and the prophet. Why? Because God took care of her. What I'm saying is we can come up with all kinds of reasons 
why it's okay to be greedy, why it's okay to envy others, why it's okay to be, to, to be depraved, why it's okay to have sex outside of marriage, why it's okay for any of these things. And we may think that it's okay, we may rationalize it in our head, that it's okay because, after all, I'm, quote, a good person. That's not what the Bible says. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says if this is your life, if you're living this life and you think it's okay, it's not. It's not okay. We need to repent. We need to get away from it. The life that we live has to be free of these things. Now, have I ever felt envy? Yes. But do I live every day with envy? No. I reject it. I repent of it. I make up my mind that I'll be grateful for what I have. In my whole life, have I ever been sexually immoral? Yes. Have I, do I stay in that place? Did I stay in that place? No, I didn't stay in that place. I left that place. And I, and I found a Christian wife, and I got married. And I stayed faithful to God and to my wife. Okay, what I'm saying is we all sin. We all fall short at times. But it's who we are. Where's your trust? Where's your love? Are you living this life? The fact is, it says here that when a person does not think it's worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, he will give you over to a depraved mind. Depraved mind means you can't think straight anymore. You're not thinking straight. You think you're thinking straight, but you're not. And that's a very bad place to be. Because once we get to a point where we're in a depraved mind, we're going to do the wrong thing again and again and again, and we're going to feel like it's okay. And the Bible is saying, no, it's not okay. These are the things that brings God's wrath on people. These are the things that separate people from God. These are the very things that keep us from having the full life that he means for us to have. So what I do does matter. It matters. And I can come up with every reason in the world why what God says doesn't apply to me, but it doesn't change the fact that it does apply to me. It applies to every one of us, whoever we are, wherever we are. The Bible says God does not show favoritism. And he also, the Bible also says, God will not be mocked. A man will reap what he sows. When I put my trust in him, the, the, the blessings that come from trusting in God is what happens. When I depend on myself, I allow my mind to be depraved. Things get all screwed up in my world. And that's a result of my choice also. In 2 Corinthians 4, verse 1 and 2, he says, Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry where we're trying to tell people about God, he says, and, and Christ says, we do not lose heart. <laughs> Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Okay, here is a different kind of thing. Does it matter what I do? The first part that we looked at talked about, does it matter what I do in regards to sin? And the Bible clearly says it does matter what I do and what I don't do. But this is another thing. We've been given a life to live. We've been given a ministry. Now, a lot of times you think, well, I have a ministry. That means that I'm a preacher. Or people think that means that I'm a priest or I'm this. No, every person who loves God has a ministry. Ministry just means ministering to somebody. 
It means taking care of somebody. And every one of us have a ministry. You may have a ministry of encouragement to people, a ministry of loving, a ministry of hospitality, but you have a ministry. Every one of us has a ministry. And the Bible says we should not lose heart. <laughs> we should not think, oh, my ministry doesn't matter. I don't matter. What I bring to the table isn't important. No, it is important. It does matter. It matters what I do. It matters that I share God's love with other people. It matters that I tell people about Christ. It matters that I open my heart to them and I be hospitable to them. It matters that I try to help people out when they need help. It matters that I tell the truth. See, these things matter. And it matters that I keep sin out of my life. Why? Because we commend ourselves to every man's conscience. If, I, if my life, if I'm in sin, if, if God is telling me that this is how I should live, and I say, yeah, I know I should be doing this, but instead I'm going to do this. But it's okay because I'm still doing this right and that right. You know, oh God, I still love you. Look, I did all these things right. But, I, but there's a big thing in my life where I know exactly what he wants me to do and I refuse to do it. Don't kid yourself. Your mind is depraved. You may think you can make up for it, but you can't. You can't purposely know for a fact that what you're doing is wrong and just keep doing it. I can't be married to my wife, for instance, and be having an affair, living in adultery, thinking I'm okay. I remember before we got married, I worked with this person, and, 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 and this person was always talking about how much they loved God, and they went to church all the time and everything, and this young lady was living with her boyfriend. And I said, don't you know what God says? God says, do not be deceived. God will not be mocked. You will reap what you sow, and people that live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Look at 1 Corinthians 6. Specifically, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. So don't come in here and tell everybody how awesome you are as a Christian and think that you can just be living with your boyfriend and sleeping with your boyfriend and that that's going to be cool. It's not going to be cool. It's not going to be all right, and it's not going to be all right with God. And if you try to pretend that it is, God's not going to have any part of it. So don't think you can live outside of God and just come and pay lips. Well, you know, I, I go to Bible talks. I have a, you know, I, I go to a church service. I, I put money in the basket every week. You know what? That doesn't mean that you love God. You love God because you love God. If I said to my wife, for instance, well, I love you. I work. I bring home. I pay the bills. What do you care if I have a mistress? What do you care if I have a lover? Do you care? Look, I'm doing everything else right. You think she'd be okay with that? No. She wouldn't say, oh, that's fine, Ken. Go ahead, just be in sin in that whole area. And as long as you got the rest of it right, you just be fine with me. She's not going to say that. I'm not going to say it either. I wouldn't be happy with her. I'd divorce her. I would, I would leave her. And that's what God's going to do with us. We can't live outside of God and think that just because I'm, I do some good things here and there, that it's going to make up for the fact that I'm cheating on God. Mm -hmm. And when I'm living in willful, knowledgeable sin, I'm cheating on God. And he's saying it's not going to work. My ministry, when I minister to someone, I have to do it in a pure and a good way. He says we've renounced secret and shameful ways. See, there are some people, they're in the ministry, and they have secret relationships. I've known preachers, you know, they try to pretend they're, they're holy. 
but they have secret relationships, shameful relationships with other women. And they think, hey, it's okay, I'm a preacher man. You know, look at me. Everybody says how great I am. Well, God's not saying you're great, pal. You're not great. Your secret and shameful ways are disgracing the name of God. And there are people that know it. You know it. The women you're doing it with know it. You can't live a secret and shameful life. You have to renounce it. The word renounce means I say that's wrong. I say it's wrong, and I'm not going to do it. And that's what these guys did. He said, we don't use deception, and we don't distort the word of God. You know, distort? The word distort means I take the word of God, and I twist it around so that it says something different than what it really says. I distort it. You know, it's kind of like being in the fun house at the carnival. And they get the mirror that's all weird, and you look in the mirror, and it makes you big and tall and skinny and fat, and you know, because the mirror makes you all distorted. But it's not the true thing. And in our ministry, we need to be careful not to distort the Word of God. We need to speak it clearly and truthfully and not distort it. God calls us to live as a people of honesty and integrity. To walk with God means that I'm going to renounce sin and I'm going to live a life of truth. We cannot distort God's words and live a life of sin and then pretend to be with God. What I do does matter. And don't think that you're going to turn to God and say, well, God, I have a good heart. That's not going to cut it. Everybody thinks they have a good heart. Not everybody, but a way bunch of us. Like 98% of the people you talk to them say, well, I've got a good heart. But then by their life, it shows they really don't. They know there's a God. The Bible says they know that there's a God. But they, unless it says they, didn't, they don't recognize him, they don't honor him, <coughs> They don't give him the respect that he deserves. We need to give him the respect he deserves, the honor that he deserves by showing him the love and following him the way that we should. 1 Timothy 4.16, Paul said to Timothy as a young man, he said, watch your life and your doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you're going to save both yourself and your hearers. The thing, the way that we live and the things that we teach does matter. It matters. And even if you can't understand how it matters or why it matters, even if you can't see all the good things that are coming when you're being living in faith, even if you can't see all those things every minute, it's still right. And it's still good. And that's what faith is about. Faith is believing what I can't see. If the only way I'm going to trust God is for him to show me everything and the good results that come every time I'm faithful, then I don't have any faith. I don't have any faith. All I am is a person walking around that has to be, I have to have everything given to me, everything proven to me. And that's just not how it's going to work. And it's not going to work with God. And I'll tell you something else. It's not going to work with anybody else either. I have to trust my wife. I have to trust my friends. I have to know in my heart that even if I don't know every second everything going on or why, I got to trust that it's right and good. Okay? And it's most important when it comes between us and God. So what we do does matter. And we need to think about that and think about how am I living and in what way am I walking with God and loving and trusting Him and in what way am I not. And whatever way that I'm not, let it, let yourself feel the shame. Let yourself feel the sadness 
of hurting God. And let that shame and sadness motivate us to change, to repent, and to get right with God. And if we do that, watch what God does in your life. Because as we said before, earlier, it's the people that put their love and trust in God that have no regrets. Those that know God and don't trust Him and don't love Him are going to have tons of regrets. Be a person who lives without regret. And you'll be glad that you did. So, amen. amen. Bye, everybody. Love you.